The Legend of Zelda. A name, a game, and a series that has captured the hearts and devotions of gamers the world over. For nearly 30 years, adventurers have stepped into the boots of the lone hero Link on his many quests through the land of Hyrule and beyond. With each new system, Nintendo loyalists earnestly await for the announcement of the next installment of the series. And with each new adventure, we are reminded again and again why we love this world, its lore, and the unforgettable characters we meet along the way. That love has driven and produced a following and fandom that is expressed beautifully in art, music, and cosplay, to professional performances, and even adaptations to other gaming genres. We've come so far in our journeys that we might forget how much we've actually gone through. It's been so long since we've played our favorite game that we might not be sure why we loved it in the first place. Most of us have that particular level or entire game that we just can't stand or haven't touched and don't know what we've missed. And everyone can benefit from stepping back for a minute or two and appreciating our beginnings, our experiences, and the potential for the future. With all these things in mind, I invite you to join me as we take a look at all of the games blessed with the title Legend of Zelda. And we will start with the game that started it all. How do you decide what goes into a franchise? The Nintendo Entertainment System was the company's first major system, and the soon-to-be international sensation. Over 800 titles would be made for the NES, a number unmatched until the Game Boy Advance 18 years later, and obviously not all of them would deserve or even need later installments. Aside from Super Mario, which had already claimed the position of Nintendo's mascot, how do you decide which unique titles will live on? While many factors can go into answering that question, it wouldn't take a degree in marketing to see something special arriving in Japan in 1986 and in the United States the next year. Without even looking at its title, you could tell Nintendo had high expectations for this game. All you had to do was look at the cartridge. In what became a tradition for many of its sequels, the sparkling gold cartridge immediately catches the eye and tells you that this game, above all others, is a treasure. The gold casing is a reflection of the time and effort spent in developing the game, as well as the quality of the game itself. The team in charge of creating The Legend of Zelda was the same one in charge of Super Mario Bros., and worked on both of them at the same time. Ideas would be sorted into what would work for Mario and what would work for Zelda. Both games focus much more on the adventure of the game, rather than just getting points, although Mario still kept score. But the Zelda universe began from its introduction and story as a personal adventure to explore a world and then save it. The general story behind the original Legend of Zelda is quite simple. With such little processing power and minuscule memory space, seriously, you can take pictures with your phone using more data than what this thing had to work with, very little of the plot could actually be explained in-game. All you get is a paragraph in the opening sequence explaining that to avoid Ganon getting the Triforce of Wisdom, Zelda split it into eight pieces that you now have to recover. There is, however, more to the tale. But to get the full story, you had to refer to the game manual. If you do, what you find is a simple yet dramatic story of a country and a princess in peril. Hyrule is described as a little kingdom amidst an era of chaos. The only thing significant from this land involved tales of the Triforce, golden triangles with mystical powers. One day, the country is invaded by an army led by the proclaimed Prince of Darkness, Ganon, who is successful in stealing the Triforce of Power. Fearing Ganon's might, Hyrule's ruler, Princess Zelda, split the remaining Triforce, the Triforce of Wisdom, into eight fragments and hid them in labyrinths all over Hyrule. She then sent her nursemaid, Impa, to find a hero capable of defeating Ganon. Upon discovering this plot, Ganon imprisoned Zelda and sent soldiers after Impa. Impa is nearly captured when a wanderer appears and drives off the assassins. It is this young man that Impa implores to collect the pieces of the Triforce of Wisdom and thereby gain the power to defeat Ganon and save the princess. The name officially given to this young man is Link, and there are a number of reasons why Nintendo chose that name. The most important, though, is the connection, or link, that this character is supposed to be to the player. 
After you leave the title screen, you're taken to a registration screen and are allowed to input your own name for your link. Once you do, that link is your representative in the adventure. No longer are you controlling some other pre-made character. In a real sense, you're playing as yourself. And what happens from then on is yours alone to react to and deal with. This sense of personal connection is enhanced by how you continue your journey. Before Zelda, when you ran out of health or lives in video games, you either had to start over from the very beginning of the game, or were given a set of images or symbols as a kind of password system to put you back to a set point. The Legend of Zelda cartridges contained a tiny battery that kept the game's memory intact after the game turned off. For the first time ever, this let players save their game. Instead of starting over or going through the hassle of programming your spawn point, you simply went back and started up where you left off, just as if you had camped out for the night and were ready to continue your journey the next morning. It gives a consistency that makes it feel as if it is truly you who is on the adventure. And what an adventure it is. Once you have your name set, you're ready to go. Literally. No instructions, no items, no additional backstory or exposition. You don't even get an arrow telling you which direction to go. You're free to go where you want and do what you want. This freedom is both refreshing and daunting. Unlike Super Mario Bros., where you have a defined start and end point for each level, you instead have an 8x16 overworld that from the very beginning you can reach nearly every nook and cranny of, provided you have the skill to make it there. That's a lot of ground to familiarize yourself with. And with no map and no direction, there's no guarantee that you won't accidentally wind up somewhere that you're not ready for. But for those willing to brave the dangers, this freedom allows players to explore in whatever way they see fit. You can go get your sword and start looking for the first dungeon. You can collect rupees and go shopping for some needed items. Or you can just wander around and familiarize yourself with Hyrule. In fact, with hidden rupee caches and some skillful work, it's actually possible to go through the entire game up to the final boss without having a sword at all. But it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. Even with sword in hand, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by what you're expected to do. Three heart containers means you have, at most, a measly six hits you can take before you're done. Your tiny shield gives you minimal defense from projectiles, and it seems like nearly every enemy is faster than you are. That anxiety is strengthened even further when you take a closer look at your sword. Your brown sword. Holy... It's made of wood! You've been given the equivalent of a large stick to fend off moblins, octoroks, and very soon Stalfos, and worse. Things don't get any easier when you finally locate the first dungeon. The music immediately alerts you to the fact that you are in enemy territory. Which gets even worse when you're near the end of the dungeon and can literally hear the boss in the next room. And unless you really got used to the controls, you're as frantic as you were at the start of the game. The only real difference between here and the outside occurs when you finally locate the map and compass. Now you finally have a defined destination and a path to get there. That tiny difference gives you an objective to center your attention and calm your nerves. You're better able to focus on each individual room because you know that you're actually making progress towards your overall goal. As you move through the labyrinth, you learn the basic rules of dungeon crawling. Some enemies have items, some rooms require you to defeat all the enemies, you get to push blocks, find keys, open doors, and obtain your first treasures. By the time you defeat the first boss, a game piece of the Triforce, you start feeling like this game is actually beatable. Soon you start noticing secrets everywhere, both in dungeons and in the outside world. Some are spelled out for you, while others are a secret to everybody. Over time, you learn dungeon locations, where to buy the best items, and the only real challenges come from the dungeons themselves. That idea of eventually familiarizing yourself with your world is exactly what the designers had in mind. After several hours of working your way around time and time again, 
I rule is as much your backyard as the one sitting behind your house. Even the dungeons have a string of progression. The first few dungeons have only a room or two with high levels of difficulty, with the bosses testing your timing and control. As you move forward, the dungeons become more complex and challenging, but with the appropriate upgrades to your sword, health, and defense, you're always able to eventually overcome. Honestly, it gets to the point where just getting through the dungeon is a great deal worse than dealing with the boss. In some extreme ways. Once you get to the final few dungeons, the game reminds you how far you've come by sending you through a gauntlet of former enemies and bosses that, at this point, are almost laughably easy. Eight dungeons later, you finally completed the Triforce of Wisdom. And from the last dungeon, you're finally able to find and assault Ganon's Lair, which is, for once, appropriately named Death Mountain. The music has changed, every room is filled with enemies, including some new ones, and the entire dungeon is half the size of the overworld. With more hidden passageways and bombable walls than ever before, you're required to use all of your wits and skill to find the final key to Ganon's defeat and make your way to where the Prince of Darkness awaits your challenge. It's as nerve-wracking as when you started the game, but now you're armed with your developed skill and past success, giving you confidence right alongside your nerves. And succeed you must, for you have truly become the hero who will save Zelda and the land of Hyrule. A quest that from this point on we will soon and gladly take up again and again. It's interesting to see just how far The Legend of Zelda has come from its beginnings 30 years ago. The stories have become more elaborate and expansive, technology has improved the graphics and gameplay, nearly everything can be told and retold in ways that trump what the original Nintendo was capable of. Yet so much of what makes Zelda, Zelda, comes back to this original game. It's here that the original plot points of Zelda, Link, Ganon, and the Triforce were brought into being. The idea of exploring an unknown world and its hidden dungeons began here, along with the weapons and tools to explore that world and protect yourself from the monsters that inhabit it. In fact, so many of those monsters, from the nut-shooting Arcturox to the arachnoid Goma, continue on through the series that it would be easier to list off the enemies that haven't made another appearance. But beyond the easily recognizable items and enemies, the original Legend of Zelda gave us a feeling of adventure and personal achievement that is difficult to find in other franchises, and yet it's repeated in the land of Hyrule over and over again. With its ability to make the player feel like they are truly the ones on the adventure, The Legend of Zelda in many ways pioneered what we know today as the role-playing game of game consoles. And yet the franchise has for the most part kept itself away from that formula. Instead, giving us an adventure that is challenging to both video game prowess and puzzle-solving skills. Those challenges, coupled with the environment and story, make it feel like you are accomplishing something more than just one more boss defeated, one more level cleared. Every item obtained or puzzle solved is a victory, and it's marked with its own fanfare. As you progress and grow in strength and skill, you become exactly what the land of Hyrule needed, a hero. And while heroes may ride off into the sunset after all as well, we know that we will always come back when Hyrule, Zelda, and the Triforce call again. Thank you for joining me and looking back at the original Legend of Zelda. There's way too much from this game to put into one video, so if you have a favorite moment or aspect of the game that you want to share, leave a comment and let me know about your love for this game. If you want to look more into how this game can be played, you can check out my playthrough of The Legend of Zelda. If you enjoyed watching this video and want to see more, I plan on making more tributes for as many Zelda titles as I can. So please subscribe and you'll be alerted when I get a new video up. I hope you'll join me next time as we look at Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. See you soon.